Welcome into EP Wealth Advisors Informed Investor Market Update. I'm Rob Black. Joining me today, Adam Phillips, CFA and CFP, Director of Portfolio Strategy with EP Wealth. 2022 is two months into the game, and it's been an interesting two months. Russia and Ukraine has a conflict that is raging on. I guess it's about a weekend now. We'll see where it goes. There's a risk off mentality on Wall Street. But let's do a quick update on the market numbers for the year. The S&P 500 is down 8%. The NASDAQ is down 12.4%. The Dow Jones Industrial Average down 6.2%. The 10-year Treasury flirted with the two, but it's pulled back to 1.9%. Bitcoin's down 18.5% for the year. And oil up 30% in the first two months of the year. In a year where we're fighting inflation, oil's not helping. Russia and Ukraine seem to be tied to cost of oil and much, much more to think about. Adam, where do we start with current market action? Yeah, I mean, there's been plenty to digest these last few days. I, I think where I would like to start is the fact that the S&P 500 actually gained 6.6% uh, in the last two days uh, of, of the week, on uh, last Thursday and Friday, uh, after uh, starting on Thursday morning uh, in, in pretty negative territory, rebounded, and then some into the end of the week. And so I mention that because it's important, even though we're living with this day-to-day -day volatility, all this global, this geopolitical uncertainty, I think it's important to be able to, as we've talked about before, Rob, take a step back and, and not give into the temptation, not give into the emotions and really stick to your long-term discipline because we know the market can experience these, uh, th th these bounces. And when it appears that things are at their worst and maybe you should be selling, the market can come, can come back and surprise you. And so even though we're still living in this period of uncertainty and the market could still exhibit some, some volatility here, I think it's just important to focus on the long term. So this is a conflict and conflicts in nature are typically shorter than we think that they are and they typically recover a little bit faster. Um, what's the perspective at the IPC, the Investment Policy Committee at EP? Is it reposition a little bit? Is it, what's the, I'll, I'll let you tell me what's going on there before I put words in your mouth. Yeah, no problem. Well, look, I, I think that we we always approach these and, and fr from the standpoint of we're going to take a step back and really assess the situation. We know that history suggests these have been um, they've, they've been relatively short lived, as painful as they are when you're living through them. This period of volatility, they, they typically do not last forever. And so um, when we've seen these sell offs in the past, almost every single time you fast forward one year and you've seen that performance has been positive if you if you bought on that day and so not saying we want to you know we, we want to necessarily put money to work right now and, and get it, uh, extremely aggressive but i think it's just important to tell us that you know let's focus on the long term see what the long term implications are if any to what's going on today and so within the investment uh, committee we're, we're talking about what is what does this mean and and, and i think we need to acknowledge that this is very different than, than what we've seen in the past, the 2014 invasion of Crimea. This is on a different scale. It's a different order of magnitude. So let's just acknowledge that <clears throat> this is happening at a time when inflation is already running hot and uh, energy prices were already um, trending higher. And we know that this is going to as much uh, havoc as it is re uh, wreaking on the Russian economy. We could talk about that in a minute. We know that uh, European countries, uh, um, think of Germany, those who are extremely reliant on uh, on, on Russia for uh, for things like energy, for natural gas, for for oil uh, imports. We know that they're going to have a really tough time here, and so I think we need to look at it uh, through a little bit of a, a different lens or or an updated lens, and just understand that this might mean that inflation lasts a little bit longer and maybe runs a little bit hotter than we expected over the short term. But so far, we're looking at this and saying, you know, we're, we're going to stick through it. We've seen that valuations have come in. So they're a little bit more, I, I don't want to say they're, they're cheap. Uh, equity market valuations are cheap, but they're certainly more reasonable, reasonable than they've been over the last, say, year and a half or so. So that's good. We're watching profit, uh, profit expectations for the S&P 500. Those are, are still looking pretty healthy. They're not trending in the wrong direction. So we're watching to see if they do, but so far, so good there. Uh, so we, I, I think at this point, we're just kind of waiting this out. I, I don't think that we can claim to have an upper hand on anyone else. Um, unfortunately, we're, we're just kind of waiting and seeing where this goes from here, just like everyone else is. Um, but you know, in, in the absence of that, we're focused on, on the data and the data is still supportive, I would say, broadly speaking. You and I have only known each other for the last couple of years, but I think we have a similar wavelength, uh, professionally speaking, as the way we think. You talked about Russia and the economic problems that they're having. I've never been a big fan of Russia investing directly in Russia because 
I don't know how to speak Russian. And I've never been a big fan of, no, of investing in China because I don't know how to speak Chinese. I tend to let other professionals consider it for me per se. Um, you're seeing Russia have 20% interest rates. You're seeing the devaluation of their currency. There is extra risk in investing in foreign markets is my assumption. And I just kind of want to see where you go at this because the United States has capitalism that we fall back on and it creates far fewer problems, I think, than say Russia and China with um, their governments that kind of change the rules sometimes on the fly. Well, absolutely. I mean, look, we're we're a, a more mature economy, uh, mature in in a number of ways, I would say. But but uh, even though it doesn't quite seem like it, maybe mature doesn't seem like the right word to use when we're talking about it from a political perspective. Um, but but you know, I, I think from an investment landscape, yeah. I mean, I, I certainly think that we can invest in the U.S. with a with a higher degree of confidence. Doesn't mean that we should avoid certain foreign investments and those specifically to emerging market economies. And so we still have a a what we would feel is a healthier allocation to emerging markets. We don't want to avoid them completely. We don't want to load up on them either. But it's important to have some exposure there simply for diversification. So you know, the, the way that we prefer to do that is to use mutual funds and those that have uh, analysts and, and experts that are actually on the ground there and, and, and have a pulse on what's going on because you, you, you need to, you know, each of these areas has their own unique political risk, regulatory risk that is frankly, it's, it's, uh, it, it's things that we can't necessarily uh, know as much about um, living here and, and without speaking the language, understanding the culture. And so we rely on the experts for that. Um, but uh, but I would say yeah Russia I, I would think traditionally is seen as uh, as an area where we want to have uh, much lighter exposure even before this and and just knowing that that uh, there's a lot more uncertainty there and what we've seen just over the last few days here is uh, is they're feeling taking the brunt of the damage here uh, at least in economic terms uh, I don't think this is really shaping up and and uh, coming to a the quick resolution that uh, that that uh, Vladimir Putin had had expected. Uh, and so we've seen today that uh, the Russian Central Bank raised rates from 9.5% to 20%, so more than doubling the policy rate. They, they've uh, shut down the, um, the, the equity markets in Russia. They're forcing large exporters to sell a good portion of their foreign currency holdings. So they're doing all these things because they're seeing that the ruble is plummeting. Um, this is going to just wreak havoc on uh, on inflation there potentially, and and so uh, we're seeing that a, a lot of these sanctions that have been announced are, are really serving to cripple or at least uh, um, create some some short term disruption to the Russian economy and the Russian markets. And I think that's just one reason why um, you always need to be careful about investing in these regions. Bring it back home a little bit. On Friday, we get the jobs report out of the United States. First Friday of every month. Oftentimes I get a little too rudimentary and I say, this is the only economic piece of data that means anything to me. And again, I'm ex exaggerating, but if people in America have jobs, we tend to spend our paychecks and we support the economy. Sometimes we delay and save a little bit more money like during COVID. What are you expecting on the jobs report on Friday and the implications for inflation with wages as well as um, cost of doing business? I think that uh, for so long, we, we've looked at the first Friday of every month that this payroll uh, report as the most important economic data point that we've had. It gave, it gave us the best read on the economy. I think over the last several months, it's probably been replaced by inflation data. So mm -hmm. the CPI report um, to, to name one and, and the main one. Um, but uh, but I think this this uh, Friday's report is still very important. Uh, we, we we're still looking to get back to the pre-pandemic level on overall employment in the U.S. And so I, I think the the average uh, estimate for job growth in the U.S. during the month of February uh, will be is, is somewhere around 400,000 jobs, expecting the unemployment rate to drop ever so slightly to 3.9%. So we know the jobs market is tight. We know the labor market is tight. There are a lot more job openings in the U.S. than there are people that are even looking for work. Uh, and, and so it tells you that, you know, that this is why we're seeing upward pressure on wages. And uh, obviously, that plays into this uh, this inflation narrative that we've been we've been talking so much about. And so, I'm expecting a healthy report here. I think that we're still going to see wages increase um, and and at a pretty healthy clip here on a year over year basis, and, and even month over month. So it tells you that this inflation story isn't going away. Uh, and I think that just to take it a step further, that's the reason that we expect. Uh, the Fed is still very likely, uh, if not guaranteed, to start raising rates at their March pol uh, policy meeting. You know, as, as we've been dealing with this uh, Russia and Ukraine conflict over the last week or so, there's been talk about will this 
lead the, the Fed to reassess um, their, their plans for policy going forward and starting with the, their next FOMC meeting in March? And I think the answer is no. I mean, I know that here, realistic, uh, historically, we, we've seen the Fed hold off on tightening. They've actually loosened policy, meaning dropped rates um, uh, at, the, at the beginning of conflicts. Um, but I don't think that we're going to see that this time around with inflation at over 7% on a year-over-year -year basis. I don't think they can afford to wait it out. They, and, and really, I mean, the, the, the economy is strong enough to justify raising rates here. So, uh, and, and I think that that kind of plays into something else that's on, on the calendar for this week. And, and that's the uh, Jay Powell's testimony uh, which is being held over two days on Wednesday and Thursday. And so he'll likely talk about policy, probably just kind of take a more wait and see approach and say that they're, they're probably still on target for a 25 basis point uh, hike in, in March, but um, maybe just kind of leaving the door open to a 50 basis point rate hike. And, and the reality is that we're still going to have another uh, CPI report between now and when the Fed uh, ultimately convenes uh, in, in a couple of weeks here. So um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's uh, even outside of what's going on with Russia and Ukraine, it's still a lot on the calendar uh, this week. A lot of inflation is, and that's setting us up for the back half of when does it start tempering a little bit lower? When do we get it under control? Um, with the Fed chairman speaking on th Wednesday and Thursday, Jerome Powell, are we expecting, uh, is he trying to contain inflation or is he trying to fight it? Last year, he's like, oh, it's, it's, it's going to run out. It's going to play its course. It's going to be short term. Do you think he'll focus on the health of the U.S. economy, or maybe he has some, you know, opportunity to uh, look at Russia and say, eh, $125 oil would be very inflationary." So, uh, will he change his messaging now that he's kind of closer to taking action? Do you think? I think that you know, if if history is any guide, I, I think that he's going to be walking this tightrope, and, and he's going to be very careful about his language. I think he's done a better job at at making sure he doesn't surprise investors, and so he'll probably. Um, throw in a, a few comments there about the strength of the economy and its ability to absorb this, this kind of near-term shock potentially to the global economy and how the U.S. is relatively shielded, looking at the health of the labor markets, um, looking at consumer balance sheets. So things look good overall, but acknowledging the risks that things like higher oil prices have on the outlook for inflation. And so I think he's probably going to take a balanced or measured approach here and, and I think the end result or conclusion there is going to be that they, they're still certainly justified in, in raising rates uh, and they will leave the door open to remain nimble. And I, I think he's, he's used the words uh, nimble and humble uh, in the past to um, acknowledge the fact that they don't have the crystal ball and they're going to potentially need to change policy on the fly as they get new data. And what that data might mean is if higher oil prices linger along um, for longer than, uh, than currently anticipated. And so if that were the case, they would have to uh, maybe step, uh, step a little bit harder on the, uh, on, on the brakes there to, to try to um, put some downward pressure on inflation. I want to talk about one of my favorite people, Warren Buffett. He just had a, a big weekend, his shareholders meeting. He sends out a letter and the performance of Berkshire Hathaway is up about 6% this year. Clearly a winner compared to the S&P 500 clear to the NASDAQ. 25 years ago, when I started this industry, I hated Warren Buffett. I wanted to beat Warren Buffett. Now he's my favorite person in the whole entire world because he's made investing very intelligent for the average person to understand and digest. Um, Amex, Wells Fargo, Coca-Cola, um, Apple, Gillette, things that we use and consume each and every day. His profits were up 45%. We're not going into Berkshire Hathaway, but let's, let me ask you, what does Warren Buffett mean to you? When I say the name, what sort of response do you give? Well, look, I mean, he's he's a legend, right? And and he is he's focused on, um, you know, on on the the fundamentals and and the data. And I think that's where we try to be. He's he's constantly um, trying to educate in, investors and and get them to take the emotions out of it, focus on on the data and what the numbers mean to them. And that's really the we we try to adopt a similar uh, approach and philosophy here. Um, about about focusing on on value, focusing on uh, long term uh, catalysts, and, and I think that really helps you to ignore some of the noise that we that we um, now kind of are, are surrounded by on a day to day basis. I, I think if you simply watch the the headlines and, and and watch what the screens are telling you, you can go to a very dark place and probably a place that doesn't really help your portfolios. But if you can take a step back and focus on longer term fundamentals and data, I really think that's where success lies. And so I think that's really the biggest impact. And it's really that serves as the best reminder for us and on, on how to remain disciplined as investors. Greedy when others are fearful, be fearful when others are greedy. The man has meant so much to me. And when he does pass, because he's 91, 
I'm gonna take the day or two off from work and just uh, think fondly of them. And you know what's funny? I'm not kidding. Um, Adam, is there anything else that we need to focus on as we wrap up this segment of the Informed Investor Market Outlook? No, I think we've pretty much covered a lot. I think we'll have plenty to uh, to catch up on uh, this time next week. So I'm looking forward to that, and uh, you know, hoping for a. Um, you know, a, a relatively quiet week. I know we have a lot on the calendar and, and hopefully uh, from a geopolitical sense, we, we see some improvement here as well. Um, so uh, uh, no, I, I think that's pretty much it for now. I think we could leave it there. Sounds good. Thanks very much. I'm Rob Black for EP Wealth Advisors, the Informed Investor Market Outlook. He's Adam Phillips, CFA, CFP, Director of EP Portfolio Strategy. Good day. Good day.